Um, we are very fortunate today to have a very distinguished guest. He is Professor of Law and the Director of the Health Law Institute at Hamline School of Law in St. Paul, Minnesota. We only got him here because of the lure of good weather in San Diego. <laughs> Uh, and of course our well-informed audience, which he's looking forward to talking to. <clears throat> he uses the law to both improve medical decision-making and to protect patients' rights at the end of life. His areas of interest include medical futility, advanced directives, and brain death. He writes about these in nearly 200 articles in medical journals and legal journals and books and chapters. And he's also co-author of the definitive book called The Right to Die, the law at the end of life. This is not just some guy we pulled in off the street, as you can see. <laughs> he received his JD and his PhD in philosophy and bioethics from Georgetown University. He's here today to talk about dementia, avoiding unwelcome uh, medical treatment. Join me in welcoming Thaddeus Mason Pope. <laughs> So, so I call this strategies uh, to avoid advanced dementia, all right? Okay. Death is not always bad. <laughs> and life is not always good, right? For many, the alternative to death in some circumstances is worse than death itself, okay? So the goal is not to avoid death, right? That's obviously an impossible goal, right? So that's, that's not the goal, right? What is the goal? Well, the goal, uh, better stated, is to avoid a bad death. And you might say that there's two ways to break that down and define that, right? And I think it's in terms of you, avoiding a bad death means you're avoiding two types of risks, okay? The risk of dying too fast, that's not good, um, but also dying too slow. Right? Those are the two types of risks that might constitute a bad death. And in the United States, the default is aggressive, curative-directed treatment, no matter what, right? No matter how dire the circumstances, that's the default. If we can keep you biologically alive, we will, unless you opt out and get off that train. So the, big, the bigger problem right now in the United States is dying too slow. So what I want to talk about is how uh, to avoid advanced dementia. So this, this, is, this is a patient in stage seven Alzheimer's, okay? So she, she can't speak, she really can't interact with her environment, can't communicate, doesn't recognize her loved ones, right? Really deprived of basically all of the things that made her life meaningful and worthwhile. And, and we'll come back to her, but she didn't want to live in, in these circumstances, and many people uh, many, many people do not, and, that, and that's what we're going to talk about. The, the challenge is that to avoid that um, is, is tricky, right? There aren't well-established uh, rules or protocols for how to avoid ending up in advanced dementia. There's no obvious solution, right? The, 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 the thing that we've had in California since 1976, the Advanced Healthcare Directive, those, those directives traditionally and still um, address what you might call post-1960s technology. Right? A lot of stuff that was invented in the late 50s and early 60s, like the mechanical ventilator, like dialysis, like CPR, antibiotics, feeding tubes, right? That, you absolutely have a right to refuse those things. You can put that in your advanced directive or your pulse, and generally that will be honored. That's all settled. The problem is when we're talking about patients who are living in advanced dementia, they're normally not on any of that stuff, right? They have the right to turn it off, but they're not, the, uh, they're not connected to any of it, so that, that right is meaningless. So they don't have anything to turn off. So, what are the paths to avoiding uh, living in advanced dementia? So I want to talk about two types of paths, and then there's, there's multiple specific paths in each type. So the two basic types of paths are to act now, or when you first get a diagnosis of dementia, for example, or even earlier, right? But, act, but the idea is you're acting now while you still have capacity. And then the other choice would be to prepare an advanced directive that might be implemented later 
at a time when you don't have capacity. So those are the two basic types of paths. So I'll do these one at a time. So acting now, okay? So some people ask, because it's so high profile and it's, it's so salient in, in, the, in the consciousness, in the media and everything, is the California End of Life Options Act, right? Well, what about that, right? Can, is that gonna be helpful, right? So this is sometimes called uh, medical aid in dying. Um, California legalized this a few years ago, right? The idea here is you can ask and receive uh, a prescription drug uh, from, from a physician that then you could self-administer that would rather quickly cause your death, okay? So that's now legal in California and seven other states in the country. The problem, the problem with this option um, is that you can't satisfy two of the eligibility conditions at the same time, and you have to satisfy all of the eligibility conditions to be eligible. So you need to have a terminal illness first, right? Which means an incurable and irreversible condition that's likely to cause death within six months. And also, right, also, you have to have decision-making capacity, right? The ability to communicate and understand the healthcare decision that you're making. The problem, of course, with dementia is that if you, if you still have capacity, then you're probably at an early enough stage in, the, in, the, in dementia uh, that you're not terminally ill, because it has a long timeline. Um, and by the same token, if you are terminally ill and your, de events, your dementia is that far progressed, then you're at a point where you no longer have decision-making capacity. So the problem is you cannot satisfy all of the eligibility conditions at, at the same time. Now that might change someday. Um, some of the European countries have relaxed the eligibility conditions for medical aid and dying. And Canada is considering doing that right now, this month and next month. Um, but as of right now, today, um, the End of Life Options Act just really isn't relevant or helpful for uh, dementia. But there are some other, there are some other exit options. Uh, and let me, let me talk about two. Now what we're talking about still are acting now, right? Acting while you still have capacity to act by yourself. So one, one option is inert gas, okay? So this is, this is an exit option that's described in the, in the best cell, which probably is back there on the table, um, right, the final exit, right? Um, and so this, this has been around for a long time. The, the basic idea, right, is you would put a clear plastic hood over your head and that would be connected to, it would fill with an inert gas. It's traditionally been helium, well, it doesn't have to be helium. Um, and then that would cause, um, an, in an, you would die from anoxia, lack of oxygen to the brain. Now, the, the challenge with this is that the patient has to do it all by herself, uh, meaning the patient has to go and get the helium or the inert gas, the patient has to get the other apparatus, and the patient has to know how to uh, assemble it uh, all by herself, and, and do it all by herself. Now, there are um, what we would have called exit guides who will come for free, for no charge, to your house and instruct you and, uh, and how to do it, but you still have to do it uh, you still have to do it yourself. All they're doing is providing counseling and advice. So this is a relatively unique option compared to everything else that we're going to talk about because most exit options are done with clinicians, right, with licensed healthcare providers. Um, and this, this is not, the inert gas option is what you would call a non-medical option. Okay, so let me turn then to the, to the, to the medical options. Um, and, the, and the main one I want to talk about is VSED. Are pe people familiar with VSED? Heard of VSED? Yeah. A lot of people, okay. So, what well, it's an acronym like Voluntarily Stopping Eating and Drinking, VSED. Um, and it basically has three elements of the definition of what exactly is VSED. We're talking about patients who are physiologically able to take food and fluid by mouth. So, it's not, we're not talking about patients that are so far. Um, uh, ill, right, that, they, that they, their body is shutting down. These are patients that still can swallow, but they're making a voluntary and deliberate decision to not do that. And the reason that they're doing that is to cause their death from dehydration, right? And the evidence that's out there, and this has been studied a fair amount, um, is that that will happen if you, if, if you completely stop intaking fluids, you will die in 8 to 14 days. Oh, most people will die in 8 to 14 days. Um, the evidence shows that this is a peaceful and comfortable way to hasten death. Uh, there's a lot of 
uh, first person narratives, you know, the people talking about their, their family member. I mean, there's a book called Gramps, which has been around for a long time. More recently, there's a book called Dying Wish, where this, this, uh, he, he, he was a physician who, who hastened his death by V said. Um, there's a more recent movie called Tomorrow Never Knows. Um, there's, and, I, and I saw Phyllis Schachter's book back there on the table. So Phyllis Schachter wrote a book about her husband's use of said, and she also does a TED Talk about that and has a lot of other, she has her own website, a lot of resources on Phyllis's website. I edited a whole collection in this bioethics journal, people talking about their family members' experience with said. But even more importantly, um, the medical literature, the peer-reviewed medical literature really supports this. This is a study in the New England Journal of Medicine um, looking at nurses, ex the title of nurses' experiences with hospice patients who refused food and fluid to hasten death. So in the study, they interviewed 100 nurses in Oregon who had cared for patients who had hastened their death <coughs> with VSED. Um, and the nurses reported that most of the deaths that they witnessed um, and were involved with were peaceful with little suffering. Um, and in fact, that eight to 14 day time period was perceived not as a burden, not, not that it was like so slow and drawn out, but in fact as a benefit because it provided uh, an opportunity for reflection and family interaction and mourning. And, and even more telling, in the Oregon study, VSED was preferred um, by a lot of patients. So at the time of the study, and you, and you know this, that Oregon first legalized medical aid in dying with their, with their Death with Dignity Act in 1994, went into effect in 1998. At the time of the study, that law was in effect. So, and, and the study involved mostly uh, advanced cancer patients. So at the time of the study, somebody with terminal cancer in Oregon had two options, right? You could, you could get the lethal prescription under the Death with Dignity Act, or you could be said, so they, these are people who had both options, um, and twice as many people chose visa even though they had medical aid and dying as an option. This year, there's been a lot of additional clinical guidance on visa, all saying that it's a good option for patients. Um, this, is a, this is a study um, that was in JAMA Internal Medicine in 2018, basically providing guidance to clinicians on how to do this safely and effectively. And then there's another article in the Journal of the American Geriatric Society. So these are good journals, good clinicians basically saying, showing that this is a good option. There's also been this, uh, in the last year or so, an increasing number of endorsements by medical professional associations. So last summer, the American Nurses Association, a relatively large organization, um, said, yeah, we think this is a legitimate and good option for, for, the, for patients if they want this. Um, and also a number of hospice and palliative care societies also have endorsed, uh, endorsed VSA. So we have also from, some, from other countries as well. So basically the idea is there's increasing recognition that hastening one's death through VSA is, is an evidence-based end-of-life option. So why would you do it, right? Well, if you have cancer or ALS, um, then probably the reason that you might be doing it is because you perceive that the current benefits of your life are outweighed by the current burdens of your life. Now, dementia might be a little bit different because dementia, of course, is, is a progressive illness. And so it, it might be more the case that the reason you would be said in, in, in the case of dementia would be that you perceive your future burdens to outweigh your future benefits, even though it may not be happening right now. So I, I just charted this. So if you think of um, just using this simple graph that I'm about to give you, right, that, that if your cognitive function is measured on the vertical axis and time is measured on the horizontal axis, okay, then, then you're probably familiar with this, but this is just basically how dementia works, right? Over time, right, you, your cognitive function, you see that it goes off and drops to the right, the curve down, downward to the right, right, because over time, your cognitive function gets less and less and less and less. Okay, so what, what the point is, is that for many people, there's going to be a line way down here when the dementia is relatively advanced that, that many people would say, well, that's a point, right? That's a point that I, I wouldn't want to live like that, right? I wouldn't want to be sustained like that. Um, I would find that intolerable, okay? Where is that line? Um, well, it's going to be a different line maybe for each of us, right? Some of us might not even have that line. We'll say, no, I want to be kept, you know, 
probably not in this room, but um, but you know, but there's some people might say no. I I, I want to you know stay alive as long as possible. Um, but 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 generally, but generally, the place where most people are going to draw that line as to how advanced their dementia will be when they find life intolerable is probably a point in time when they don't have capacity anymore because the fact that they can't meaningfully uh, you know recognize their grandchildren or have, or smile or enjoy things um, that that's probably they don't have capacity at that time so in other words what I wanted to say is there is there's a difference in the point in time when you would lose capacity from dementia and, and there's probably a later point in time, which is the point in time of, the, of dementia that you would find life intolerable, right? So there really are two different lines. There's the point in the progression of the illness where you lose capacity, and then there's a later point in time, which is the point in time where you think, well, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a stage of dementia that I find intolerable. Okay, so two different points in time. The, the idea here is that um, to avoid the later line, right, the, the, let's call it the stage seven, out, to avoid stage seven Alzheimer's, you have to act way before stage seven Alzheimer's when you still have capacity, right? You're hastening death before you lose capacity, right? Right now, earlier stage of, of dementia, right now, your life is not intolerable, right? Things are okay. You might have some cognitive impairments, but it's not that you, that you, that you want to die. Um, but this, nevertheless, you might need to act now because now is when you still have decision-making capacity. So this is a this is sort of a bind. Um, it's a problem, right? That you, that you, people feel that they have to act too soon, sooner than they would want to act. But they feel that they have to act prematurely, right? You're hastening death while you still find life worthwhile, right? So some people refer to this problem as a problem of premature dying. Okay. But, but it is a pathway to avoid advanced dementia. So let me talk about the alternative. Um, and I should say, right, what, what the thing I've just described, right, you might be referred to as contemporaneous visa, right? Because you yourself, on your own behalf, with decision-making capacity, are asking a clinician to help you through this. Um, so you're doing it contemporaneously, face-to-face, -face, you're in charge, you're making the request. But that's going to have maybe premature. Okay, so the alternative would be to complete an advanced directive for V said later. Okay. Now the obvious advantage of this um, is that your death is not hastened until the point in time that you find life to be intolerable. So if you're going back using the same diagram, right? There's there's only one line, right? The point in time that you find life to be intolerable is the same exact point in time. That, the, that, that people, and that you're probably at that point in time not going to be able to feed yourself. So basically, you're basically saying, don't feed me, right? Don't hand feed me at that point in time. Right, so you don't have this problem uh, where, you're, where the, where the V-SED comes earlier than the point in time that you find intolerable. It's the same exact point in time. So what do I mean? So I'm going to use this term, advanced V-SED, okay? When I, and I use that term, advanced V-SED, what I mean is you're completing an advanced directive today and, and you're directing VSED in the future. Um, at what point in the future? Well, that's up to you, right? At a point that you define in your own judgment, given your preferences, values, and wishes, pointed, sorry, shouldn't walk over there, okay. At a point in time that you find to be intolerable, right? <laughs> Probably you're gonna lack capacity at that point in time. Okay, so that's what I mean. That's what I mean by advanced VSED. So, and somebody just asked me this right here, this uh, judge, um, a key question is, um, can you put that in a California uh, advanced directive? Okay, well, the, the little smirky response would be, well, you can put anything you want in a California advanced directive. The real question is, is it, is it gonna be honored, right? Is it gonna be respected uh, by the healthcare professionals? And, 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 I, and I'll just say what I, what I what I told him is it's not been tested, okay? So this is still relatively new, the idea of, of doing advanced VSED uh, directives, okay? So there, the California legislature hasn't authorized this. There's not a superior court judge in the state of California that said, you know, that approved this. Um, so it just hasn't been tested yet, okay? 
There's a lot of reasons to think it would be respected, but you have to acknowledge that this is still new. But to maximize the chance, right, that, you're, that this type of advanced directive would be honored, um, what I wanted to do is give 12 <coughs> tips for writing in advance what I'm going to call a VSED directive. And some of these are good tips for advanced care planning in general. Um, you know, and of course, that was going to carry over to this type of advanced directive as well. Okay, so the first thing is, of course, you actually have to have an advanced directive. Um, I mean, at all, right? And, and you may know that the, the overall completion rate, this is from the biggest study that was ever done. Um, it looked at 100, it's a meta study, right? So it, it looked at 150 other studies um, and, and sort of systematically reviewed that data. Altogether, it's, it's, a, it's a population in the, in the sample size of 800,000 patients. Okay, so basically it's a, it's a statistically rigorous study. Thir overall completion rate of advanced directives among adults in the United States is 37%. And every adult, every adult really should have an advanced directive. Uh, now, if you break the data down and you look just at older Americans, then the completion rate goes up to 70%. So if you start sifting the data a little bit, um, and sometimes the completion rate gets even higher, right? So if you look at, for example, nursing home residents that are over the age of 85, then the completion rate gets up, you know, to 80%. Or if you look at hospice patients, so if you start really looking at subpopulations, the completion rate gets really gets pretty good. Um, and there's reasons to be optimistic that more people will have advanced directives in the next in the future, uh, because as you probably know, Medicare now pays clinicians more to do advanced care planning discussions with their patients as a Medicare benefit. Still, three in 10 older Americans <coughs> do not even have an advanced directive. All right, so just move on in, in terms of these tips, right? Even if you've completed an advanced directive that you're not done yet, right? So there's still more to do. Um, number two, you have to pick the right agent, okay? Um, and who's that, right? The best person to speak on your behalf when you can't speak for yourself is somebody who you know and somebody who you trust. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna expand on this a little bit. In addition to choosing an agent, you really need to pick an alternate agent as well, right? So if, because what may happen is, what if your agent is not available at the time that, that healthcare providers are looking for an agent, right? Then that's a problem, right? So that, you need to have a backup uh, in case your primary agent is not available. Number four, a lot of people don't do this. Um, in addition to identifying an agent, it's often useful, and this might be especially true for VSED because VSED could be controversial, right? So it might be important to identify family who should not participate, right? And the idea here is this would help um, eliminate or mitigate conflict. Um, so in other words, what people do is they, they nominate or designate an agent in their advanced directive, but um, it may also be important to clarify not only who has authority to speak on your behalf, but to clarify who definitely does not have authority to speak on your behalf. All right, so number five, and this is really important, and unfortunately this doesn't happen as much as it should, you actually have to talk to your agent, right? You can designate your agent. A lot of times, somebody calls them and says, oh, you're listed as so-and-so's healthcare agent, right? I am, right? So it comes as a surprise. Like, they didn't even know that, that, that a certain family member had even designated them as the agent. So it's definitely not enough just to designate your agent, right? And this is, again, all of these things are good advanced care planning uh, principles in any case, but they become especially true with VSA. <laughs> Um, because again, it's more controversial still. Um, so, when you talk to your agent, you want to make sure that your agent understands your goals here, right? My goal, I want to avoid living in stage seven Alzheimer's, and I want to not, you know, I want to have my care providers not hand feed me at that point in time. Make sure they understand what you're doing and why. You want to make sure that your agent actually agrees with these goals, agrees to honor them. Um, because many times agents contradict the advanced directive. So the advanced directive says A, but the agent says B, and I, this happens all the time. There's appellate cases in California, 99 times out of 100, the healthcare providers are gonna listen to the agent, even if it's a direct contradiction of the explicit instructions in the advanced directive. And then not only 
does, you want to check does your agent agree to honor your wishes. Um, but you might also want to make sure that you're picking somebody who would be a good advocate, right? Because there may be conflict, right? Either among the family or between the family and the clinicians, right? And so you want somebody who can really push back and stand up and advocate on your behalf to make sure that your wishes get respected. All right, number uh, six, have your agent review their, their role as an agent, right? Being, serving as somebody's healthcare agent or proxy, right, is, is a job, right? It's a new job and, it, and, and it's a tough job because you're performing it under not ideal circumstances, right? A loved one is dying, right? You're probably sleep deprived and stressed out, right? So it's a tough job under tough circumstances. Um, but you want to make sure that they understand what exactly their job is. Um, it's not to do what they want done to you, it's to do what you would have wanted done to yourself. Um, and so there are some good guys, there's a free guide from the American Bar Association called Making Medical Decisions for Someone Else, a how-to guide. Uh, these are all free. Um, how, and this is another one, how to be a healthcare proxy, right? Short little guides, but basically say, hey, hello, somebody has selected you to be their healthcare agent. What does that mean? What do you have to do? What is your, you know, so, but a lot of people don't really understand what their job is as a healthcare agent. All right, number seven, really important because this is a big, a big risk point. Make your advance directive findable. Um, the statistics out there show that 76% of physicians whose patients have completed an advance directive don't know that they exist. Um, so there's a big difference between completing an advance directive and having an advance directive, right? Or I should say it better, right? It's not enough that you have the advanced directive because at the point in time that it's relevant, you lack capacity. You need to make sure that your healthcare providers have the advanced directive. So it's not enough to write it down. It has to be available. Um, this is a study in Michigan, um, in this, this, they, but they found that one third of advanced directives never showed up, right? They never showed up at the hospital. They were never used. Um, so the thing that's really important that does not happen enough is that after completing advanced directive, you have to make copies and give one to the primary agent, give one to the alternate agent, probably give one to other family members as well, maybe to a primary care physician, maybe to an attorney. Um, California is uh, one of a minority of states that has an electronic registry not used very much. I don't know if you, you could go on the Secretary of State's website for California less than 1% of the, of the population in California has uploaded an advanced directive to the electronic registry. But it makes it available, right? Because, they, because clinicians would query the registry to see if you have an advanced directive there, and if you do, then they can download it, right? It makes it more available and accessible. Because it's not, it doesn't matter how well of a job you do and how many you know, clever little phrases and how, how well you document it if, it if nobody has it. All right, number eight. Uh, Update the advanced directive, all right? Advanced care planning is not a one-time thing, right? You have to stop, reassess it, does it still reflect your wishes, values, and preferences, and, and update it. And when would you do that? You do that at what people call the, the six Ds. These are the trigger points for reassessing whether or not you might want to edit or modify your advanced directive, right? The six Ds. You reach a new decade in your life you experience the death of a loved one. You experience a divorce. You receive a diagnosis of a significant health condition, or you experience a significant decline in your functional condition. And then finally, you change your domicile or somebody moves in with you, right? Not that you necessarily would change your advanced directive at any one of these six Ds, but it's a, it's a time when you might want to stop and think about, you might want to change your advanced directive, especially like you could think about the divorce one, right? Many people name their spouse as their healthcare agent, but if you were, had a divorce, then you might want to rethink whether you want your spouse to be your healthcare agent. Um, number nine, um, add a post. Um, and I know there's some back there on the table, right? The idea is you would supplement, you, uh, you should really not have an a pulse without an advanced directive, but some people should have an advanced directive and a pulse. So in other words, you say every adult should have an advanced directive, but only a very small subset of people should also have a pulse. Um, and the difference, main, there's a lot of differences, but the key difference is that 
advanced directives are not immediately actionable, right? Meaning, for, this will take an example, EMS providers cannot honor advanced directives. They only follow orders, right? An advanced directive is just a recording of your wishes, right? Physicians need to take that and translate that into orders, right? And the, the benefit of PULST is PULST is a set of orders. That's what the O stands for, right? Provider orders for life-sustaining treatment. So it's immediately actionable in a way that advanced directives are not. Now, PULST isn't for everybody. Um, when we did, we were at the Solana Beach Library yesterday, and there are a lot of people who are perfectly healthy, relatively young, whose clinician said, let's throw out a PULST for you. Not, and it's, that's actually rather dangerous, we could talk about that afterwards if you want, but, but generally, PULST, in all the training materials for clinicians, right, PULST is for patients with serious illness and frailty, and clinicians are trained when they write PULSTs um, for patients that they really should only write, be writing PULSTs for patients that, uh, for whom they would not be surprised if that patient died within the next year. It's not 100% limited to that. I mean, there may be patients that really, really have strong preferences and want to avoid, you know, CPR, for example. But generally, that's the population for whom a pulse is appropriate. Okay, number 10. Understand your options. Okay, so, a lot of people write complete advanced directives, and that's great. Um, but before recording your preferences, make sure that they're informed. And there is, in fact, in the general public, not a great uh, sophisticated understanding of what exactly advanced dementia is. Um, and therefore, if you, if you complete an advanced directive without really understanding what advanced dementia is, then it's not clear that the advanced directive is really reflecting your preferences. So there are now, and this is good news, a number of what I call, well, what everybody calls patient decision aids, right? And these are, um, they take different forms. Sometimes they are um, interactive websites. Sometimes they are, you know, apps on your phone. Um, sometimes it's just very graphical printed literature, right? But it's, it, it, the main thing is it's not just words, right? Th these were done not just with, not just by clinicians that understand dementia, but they, then they involve graphic designers and other people who know how to convey information in a meaningful way. And so when these get tested, and they've been tested very uh, extensively, when you use decision aids as opposed to just talking to a doctor, for example, people have vastly improved knowledge of what, of what the interventions and the diagnoses entail. And, and the best evidence really revolves around videos. Um, so, so videos for advanced dementia you know, show patients, sometimes it's an actor, right, but they try to do it realistically, right, in advanced dementia. So you get a good sense of what exactly the symptoms um, and capabilities of a patient in advanced dementia are. Give you one quick example. This is just from one of the studies. They ask people, like, if you had advanced dementia, would you, would you just want comfort care only, right? So no, no, no antibiotics, no curative directed interventions. Um, well, when the, when the doctor just asked, or even provided a brief verbal description of what advanced dementia was, 50% of the patients consented to comfort care only plan. Um, but when you took the control group, another set of similarly situated patients, and the only difference is they watched a two to three minute video depicting and describing uh, advanced dementia. You can see that the consent rate for, for a comfort only plan went up to almost 90%. So these, these have enormous impacts. And, and I think the main point I want to convey is that VSET is again relatively controversial still. It's not well accepted as a, as a, as a treatment pathway. And therefore, you want to, the people that, are, that you're hoping are going to honor your wishes, you want to give them some confidence that you understood what it was you were asking for, right? Because they're going to wonder, is, is this really what she wanted? Really? Right? So if you said, yeah, I, I watched this video, I read, you know, there's some books on the back, you know, I read Phyllis Schachter's book, um, that, and, you really, and you would even write that into your advanced directive so whoever's reading it has confidence that you actually carefully reflected and deliberated about this before you checked off some boxes on an advanced directive. All right, so number, number 11. Um, just, now this is going to be a little bit more focused on advanced VSET. 
So we're almost done, there's only 12, right? Um, so this is important. Be, be clear on the what. What is it that you're asking for? Um, and I just want to basically use the lessons from two, two recent cases. So there have been some cases on, on advanced visa, and unfortunately they didn't, they didn't turn out too well. Um, so the one case is, um, but we can learn the lessons from these cases to avoid what happened to these women. Um, the one case is from British Columbia, uh, and the patient was uh, Margot Bentley. So Margot, when in her career, was in fact was herself a dementia uh, nurse, and so she had seen the patients um, in late stages of dementia and knew very well that she didn't want to live uh, under the circumstances that her own patients were. So she, this is her advanced directive. She, she completed an advanced directive to try to avoid that happening. Um, and unfortunately, did not draft it as well as she could have. So this, and I just want to, this, this is the key language, I guess, that might be relevant. And she says, no nourishment or liquids. And then she also says, I direct not be allowed to die, not kept, be alive, not kept alive by artificial means or heroic measures. Uh, but the key thing, right, um, is that there's nothing in any word anywhere on her advanced directive that says anything about hand feeding, food and fluid by mouth, oral nutrition and hydration, right? This, this is ambiguous. Um, and, and in fact, so the care facility in Vancouver refused to honor, well, the family, the family knew what she wanted, but so the family comes in and says, we want you to stop hand feeding our mom. She wouldn't have wanted this. Um, but the advanced director didn't actually say that. S facility refuses to honor that. The family takes the facility to court in British Columbia, um, but they lose, and they lose for a, a number of reasons, but, but, the, but the main reason I wanted to flag right now is the court said, it doesn't say, we, we don't know that she would have wanted this, it doesn't actually say that in her advanced directive. It says no nourishment or liquids. Well, a lot of people write that in their advanced directives, and they have been for decades, and what they almost always mean when they write that is they're making a reference to feeding tubes, right? Artificial nutrition hydration, or sometimes it's called clinically assisted nutrition hydration. And so those words are ambiguous, and therefore we're going to interpret them in the way that they're normally interpreted, which is to refer to this. So the take-home lesson from the Margot Bentley case is if you mean hand feeding and that's what you want to avoid, and that's, uh, then you've got to be very explicit and clear about that's what you want to happen. And, and really, there's a second case. Um, this case is from Oregon, and this is the patient, Nora Harris. Um, so Nora also wanted to avoid living in advanced dementia. Uh, she actually had what you might call a um, form, a state form, like a California Attorney General form. So it's a California advanced director. She had moved from California to Oregon. Well, the basic um, template form, right, from the California state government, does not mention VSA, does not mention hand feeding at all. Um, and therefore, since it was basically a, a pre-printed form, um, it definitely did not say anything about hand feeding or VSA or oral or, or by mouth. Um, so again, she, her, her wishes were not honored. Her husband tried to honor her wishes, went to court, but again, lost when he tried to get the care facility to honor what he understood his wife's wishes to be. So again, if you mean hand feeding, say it really explicitly. Um, there is, so I put in the, in the handout um, some, uh, at least one tool. I think the, f the first one is from the, and I, the copy didn't come out, so it, got, it turned into a black square, I think. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, but it's from, the, it's from an organization called End of Life Choices New York. So that the first tool of the three tools I put in the handout is, is a, um, is a special type of advanced directive developed by this end-of-life advocacy organization in New York. Um, there's another one, I didn't put it in there, you can look it up yourself. There's another one from their sister organization, which is End of Life Washington. So it's just in Washington State. I, I actually think the New York one might be a little bit better. Um, but this is, this is what that little square at the top of the page two should read. It should say, end of life choice in New York. I, I didn't mean to deprive them of credit. Uh, it's, their, it's, their, it's their document. So they, um, they, and they just started using this uh, in the last year. 
But the point is, there's language in there, right, that gets, that provides the specificity that, that Margot Bentley and Nora Harris didn't have, um, right? It, it says stuff really explicitly. If I'm suffering from advanced dementia, I don't want to be fed by hand. And in fact, you could even say, I don't want even hand feeding, even if I appear to cooperate you know, in my severely demented state by opening my mouth, um, if you try to put the spoon in there. Okay, so that's, the, that's, that's lesson 11. Be clear on the what. What is it that you're asking for, okay? And then finally, number 12, um, be clear on the when, right? So when is it, if, if, you, if, you, if you're declining hand feeding, right, um, food and fluid by mouth, Okay, that's fine. You're clear about what you want, but when is it that we're supposed to do that, right? Mm -hmm. Well, there's a tool for this um, as well, um, and the and the, this is this is a, and I put this as a flyer for I didn't put the whole tool in there, but there's a flyer in the packet there um, for the tools that were developed by Stan Terman. So so Stan has and he's a, psych, a, a California psychiatrist. Um, he he developed he calls it my way cards. Um, and these are, this, this helps you specify and, and actually reflect about when it is that you would, might want advanced VSET. So he has like 60 of these little cards, although you can do it online, you know, on an app as well, but there's also literally a deck of cards version. Um, so there's these little decks and they have different situations, right, on each card, right? So this, and you can think, well, is that a situation, is that a, that I would find that would, that would be such that I wouldn't want to live like that, right? This is, this, and there's little drawings for each one. So when I see people in my close family or see my best friends, I don't know who they are. Okay, um, another one, I don't use bathrooms, I let my clothes get wet and dirty, others must change my diapers. You know, then some, for some people, they might think, well, that's okay, I mean, it's not the best, but I don't, you know, don't, don't need to kill me for that. Um, the way I act now is hurtful or shameful. I may yell insulting words or take off my clothes in front of strangers. Um, I cannot remember the important events of my life. If I'm reminded, I don't know why they're important. Um, I have severe pain, but I can't say what bothers me. Doctors don't see my pain, they don't treat my pain. Anyways, there's a whole bunch of these cards, and then you could basically sort them. And like these, I don't care about these conditions as much, but I really care if, if, these, if I have any of these conditions. So these are the conditions. When this stuff happens, that's when you do the advanced visa. Okay, and then one final tool um, is advanced directives are usually written documents, right? So they're usually, it's paper. Um, although now people scan it and upload it to the, to the electronic health record. I think for VSED, it's important, um, it's not, I'm not saying it's strictly necessary, but I think it would be very helpful to supplement the written advance directive with a video advance directive. Um, because advance VSED is still new, okay? And in general, um, clinicians, and if it ever went to court, courts, the weirder the thing that you're asking for the more evidence that people are going to want, right? They're going to be wondering, like, really? Did she really want that? Because that's kind of weird. We, we, we we're skeptical that she really wanted that. So at the, the odder the thing that you're asking for, the better evidence that you're going to need that, in fact, the patient really had that. And, and a video is powerful because um, watching the patient, right, you know her face, and it's her voice. It's, she's speaking in her own voice. Uh, if you could see that, it gives people a lot of confidence that, A, Okay, it looks like she has capacity at the time that she's making, recording the preferences. B, um, uh, you know, it gives people comfort, right? I guess she really wanted it. She, so, she sounds uh, urgent, right, in the way that she's recording this video. It, it, it's powerful and people, people are willing to accede um, to wishes expressed in a video in a way that they're not when it's just a document. Because they don't know what kind of thought went into the document. It's dry and cold in the video. It has more life. So those those are the tips um, for drafting an advance visa directive. So um, I think that uh, you guys are going to ask me really hard questions that I'm not no because because a lot of this stuff, unfortunately, there are no answers. So it's not like I, <laughs> give this mea culpa up front. It's not that I it's not my fault that I don't know the answers. Some of these they're not going to be answers, but I'll do my best. Um, thank you.
judgment, right? Right. So, so in other words, you, you, your life, your, your death was hastened, but it was involuntary. Um, so that, I mean, that's one example. There's also, you know, problems of in, in medical futility conflicts. This is the recent case that went up on the California Court of Appeals this year, right? Where Scripps, um, the patient wanted continued life-sustaining treatment, but Scripps thought, well, that's not worthwhile, right? It's not going to. It's not going to. We don't think it's going to provide you enough benefit. So even though you want it, we're not going to give it to you. Um, and they're allowed to do that under the California Probate Code, but the idea is though your death was, you didn't want to hasten your death, but somebody else hastened your death for you, involuntarily. Too soon, in other words. Too, too fast, right? Your death came too fast. Yeah. Okay. So, first on the registries, right? Um, there is, there's, two, there's, there's, a, there's an advanced directive registry that's been around longer. Okay, go to this. Uh, it's, it's based off the uh, Secretary of State's website, State of California Secretary of State, right? So you can go there, and there's a portal you can go through and upload your advanced directive. You say yeah. the State of California one? No, um, you or can upload. Right. So the state, the probate code defines what an advanced directive is. It has to have certain elements, but there's no particular form, right? And as you have just observed, there are. are 5,000 different valid, I mean, because Five Wishes has a form, the Catholics have a form, the Jewish people, I mean, everybody has a form, right? So there's a million forms developed by a million different organizations. Anyone, and as long as they comply with, with the elements of the probate code, which is, you know, two witnesses or notary or, you know, those uh, formalities, it's a valid California advanced directive. The Pulse Registry is newer, okay, and it's still in a pilot stage. It's, I think the, the pilot was limited to San Diego County and Contra Costa County. Um, so, um, the pilot ends next month, right? So the, que the, the idea is though then, based on how the pilot went, then they'll launch the Pulse Registry <laughs> statewide. And I guess the third thing to mention is there are private registries, okay? So, meaning you don't have to even use, or you could use both, right? So, as an example, uslivingwillregistry.com, or there's one called DocuBank, right? All one word, DocuBank and there's a number of others. So you pay a small fee, right? But then what you could do is you could get a sticker, you know, and stick it onto the back of your driver's license. So then if you were admitted to a healthcare facility, the sticker says, this person has an advanced directive at this place, or, you know, might give a URL or, or phone number or something. And then, they, and then they can call and then they'll get it. So there's the, there's the official state registry, but there's a number of private registries as well. Well, um, so well, for, first of all, two things. Generally, there's reciprocity, right? So almost every state's advanced directive law says, like, let's, I don't know where you're hiking, let's say it was Nevada, right? That Nevada law says that a, a Nevada healthcare professional must treat a Cal must honor a California advanced directive, right? Similarly, the California physician would have to honor a Nevada advanced directive. So generally, there's reciprocity, so it would be valid in the other state. Um, your, your, your question though is how would they get it? Um, so in California, right, there may be a, um, a practice or even a duty to query the official database, right, as a matter of course. Patient comes in, we don't know if they have an advanced directive, we should check to see if they have one on the official California database. That's not going to happen in Nevada, of course, why would they check the California database, right? That, but I think that's the answer to that would be to do what I just said a second ago, which is they will check your ID, right? Because as you suggested, they need to know who to bill, right? If they don't know who you are, they don't know they can't bill anybody for you. So they need they need to figure out who you are to, to bill. Um, and when they check your ID, your advanced directive would or your your driver's license would then refer them to where it is that they can get your advanced directive. They do have a legal duty, right, to to do that. Um, now, whether that happens in the real world is a separate question, but since 1991, any healthcare facility in the United States that takes Medicare dollars, which is like 99% of them, must, on admission, figure out if you have an advanced directive, and if you do, get it, and then put it into the record. Um, so that, that, is, that is a duty under, under the Medicare conditions of participation. Right. So, first thing, I just want to say, you generally, you're well, not even generally, almost always, 
you're going to need to be doing this under the supervision of a healthcare professional, right? So I, I, the idea that the family would be doing it all on their own with the patient, I think, is generally recommended to be a really imprudent idea because, because the symptom, there's going to be symptoms not only from thirst, but from whatever the underlying, you know, from other, you know, other comorbidities. So uh, you want somebody who knows what they're doing to, 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 to appropriately alleviate the symptoms of discomfort. Okay, so generally this is going to be done under the supervision and guidance of a healthcare professional. Um, yes, well, that's, that's, that is a challenge, right? So you're right that arguably you are allowing somebody to dehydrate, right? And that looks like neglect. Um, if it's a vulnerable adult, there's a whole separate stat, you know, vulnerable adult protection. So there's, it looks, that's what it looks like. So that, and that exactly is the key reason for why you want to document the consent very, very well, right? Those, all those rules about vulnerable adults are there for the protection of the vulnerable adults. But if the vulnerable adult wants to waive those protections, it's her right to waive them as well. But you want to be sure that, 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 that her consent, or her, you might want to say her advanced directive, is, is well documented. Because I think that would be the protection from the charges of abuse or neglect. Um, but again, this is new, and I acknowledged it was new. It would be great to, 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 for, for us to do this kind of uh, session with people who work right, in adult, and protect, adult protective services and, and, and enti entities like that, so they um, are more educated about this, so when they start seeing it, they don't freak out and react in the way that you suggested they might. Yeah, so um, after, the, after, the, after a few days, right, you're, as you can imagine, you're going to be too weak to, to really get up, right? So after, after the first few days, you're, you're not going to have the strength to really get out of bed, right? So you're going to be completely bed bound in, in the middle part, right? So the hardest part is the beginning, right, the first several days. Um, later on, you're basically going to be comatose um, in the last several days. Um, so you sort of get a sense of euphoria. The way that the body reacts to dehydration um, is interesting. It probably goes outside my scope because I'm not a clinician. I think they have a video on their website because they have Bob Uslander, who is a clinician and has personally um, helped patients use VSED as a way to hasten their death. So he was there and his staff, his, his, uh, his employee clinicians, you know, can, can do a way better job than I can in getting into the details of what symptoms happen on which day. That, so that might be a little bit outside my scope as an attorney. <laughs> but I can send, I can, I can definitely give you some resources on, on people who, who, this is in the literature, so I can give you some resources to give you a sense of what, what to expect. And that's, that's another reason to do it with clinician supervision, because then they can give the family a heads up, like that this is what's gonna, this is what you should be expecting. Well, that, I mean, that's there for, I mean, that's a protection, right? The, 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 the law says you're presumed to have capacity, right? No, no physician ever has to prove you have capacity because everybody's presumed to have capacity. It's the burden of the clinician to rebut the presumption. And we don't want the presumption to be rebutted too easily. I mean, because otherwise, anytime you disagree with your clinician, they'll think, oh, you just lack capacity, right? So you want it, I mean, it's, I, I, I guess it's a, it's a patient safety protection. That to make sure that we're not declaring people incapacitated too casually, right? I mean, well, you could if you're worried about. I guess you can you can always strike it out, right? You can um, you can say, I'm afraid that I'll be in a situation where uh, my advanced directive won't be triggered because you won't be able to determine that I lack capacity. Or, but by the way, the other thing that the California advanced directive and the California probate code allow is you can specify in your advanced directive that you want it to take effect even while you still have capacity. Normally, right, normally advanced directives are springing, meaning they have no power until you lose capacity. But, but the California Probate Code is very clear that it doesn't have to be only a springing power, right? Because let's say you're, you just want, you just only want the burden, right? You're just like, I don't want to think about this, talk to my daughter, right? So you, you can make your advanced directive effective um, even if you haven't been determined to lack capacity. It's absolutely explicitly allowed in the probate code. It, it depends, I mean, two things, right? Um, because again, you could have early, early dementia, doesn't at all mean that you lack capacity, right? That's, that's again, going back to the earlier question, it's an assessment, the capacity, right, is defined as do you have the ability to understand the healthcare decisions that you're making and to communicate those healthcare decisions? 
right? So it could you could be rel you could be relatively it could be relatively past the early stages of dementia, and you could still have capacity. And the second important thing to note is um, capacity is decision specific, right? So it's not like really it's never really the question is do you have capacity or do you not have capacity. The real question is do you have the capacity to do this or do this. So the, the example that's often used, it, now VSET is a rather complicated treatment pathway, so you probably do need a higher level of capacity to understand what exactly it is that you're asking for. But something that you might have the capacity for even way, way later down in, into dementia would be the, the capacity to appoint an agent, for example. Because you know who you, 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 as long as you still recognize people, you know your family members and you know who you trust um, so, I mean, if you may remember just maybe a few months ago, the big case that was being litigated up in Los Angeles over Sumner Redstone, the guy, multi-billionaire who owns CVS Viacom, um, well, he fired his healthcare agent, right? He's way, very, very limited capacity, but the LA Superior Court said, yeah, he may have, he doesn't know who the president is, he doesn't know, you know, day of the week it is. But he knows who he wants, who he trusts, and who he doesn't trust. So he, and so the court said he does have the capacity um, to fire his healthcare agent. Anyway, so the point is, it's, it's decision specific, and the mere fact that you've got a diagnosis does not at all necessarily automatically mean that you lack capacity. I, I just uh, want to take the mic for a second to introduce the guy with the roving mic is actually roving Barry Price, uh, about whom I spoke earlier. Uh, our new president, uh, starting January 1st. So um, I did tell you who he was, and you'll find out more about him as we um, go into the next year. Thanks, Barry, for being a good microphone man. Oh, thank you. <laughs> no, that's right. It, it, you really have to, if you, if you consume anything other than the yeah. tiny amount that you might use to swab the mouth or spray, to alleviate the symptoms of thirst, the, 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 whole, the 14 days is going to become 20 or 30 days. So you really have to, yeah, you're absolutely right. Good alternative. No, I don't think even the people, I mean, you have books that are on the table. The people advocating this aren't advocating because they think it's the best choice. It's the best available choice, um, right? And so maybe in Canada, I mean, it's hard, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll have, um, because they don't have medical aid in dying. They have active euthanasia, right? The physician does to the patients, and they've had 2,500 people use it in Canada already. Um, it's not, you don't take the pills yourself. The physician does to the patient what your vet did to your cat. Um, and you're right, it's way faster. It's, it's um, probably, and it's way more effective, right? VSAG does require, at least in those first few days, a, a rather significant amount of uh, willpower. Um, either on the part of the patient or at least on the part of the family. Um, and so, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, not, it's not the best method, perhaps. It's not the most quick, it's not the most effective, it's not the most pain-free, um, but it's the best available method. Question? Any other questions? Let's take this opportunity to, um, to thank uh, Professor Pope for coming here today and giving this marvelous talk. And we know that he's a very patient person. He probably will hang out afterwards to take questions sure. as he did yesterday.